While the first five chapters of this textbook dealt with a lot of background and foundational legal information, we will now begin delving deeper into specific laws that pertain directly to fire and EMS services. In this, the sixth chapter of the text, we will explore patient privacy and EMS care related laws. Once completed with this module, you should be able to describe the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 and explain how it pertains to emergency services. Identify and describe patient privacy rights, describe Medicare and Medicaid and explain how they pertain to emergency services, describe the potential impact of the Federal Anti-Kickback Statute and False Claims Act on EMS agencies receiving Medicare funds, describe the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act and explain how it pertains to emergency services, Describe the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970 and explain how it pertains to emergency services, and describe the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments and explain how they pertain to emergency services. To help frame some of the legal principles introduced within this chapter, we will begin with a scenario where your fire department is being sued in a quitum action for allegedly violating the federal anti-kickback statute given agreements with local nursing homes to provide inter-facility transports at a reduced cost for the purposes of increasing Medicare billing. As we proceed through this chapter, some questions to keep in mind include which laws are in place to protect Medicare from fraudulent billing practices and how are those laws enforced? What is a quitom action and how does it relate to Medicare billing? It was also discovered that the person who started the quitom action against the fire department was a former officer who was defeated in a departmental election. Is it possible to remove this person from the department for insubordination or some other cause? Along similar lines, what other laws exist to govern how your EMS operations are managed? What are the potential penalties for failure to comply with these laws? For those involved in providing EMS, federal funding through Medicare and Medicaid can be critical to continued operations. While the laws governing Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement can be very complex, we will take a cursory look at aspects of Medicare and Medicaid funding that directly impact EMS agencies. Another federal law, EMTALA, impacts the duty owed by hospitals to emergency patients, including those transported by an ambulance. There is also HIPAA, which governs the privacy of patient health care data. These and other laws have a profound impact on the routine operations of EMS agencies and must be understood by EMS leaders, managers, and providers to different extents. This chapter will provide a survey of these and other laws related specifically to the EMS profession. The first EMS-related law on which we will focus is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Referred to simply as HIPAA, this law was drafted for several reasons, which included the need to improve the portability and continuity of health insurance coverage in group and individual markets, which addressed health insurance coverage for employees between jobs, to combat waste, fraud, and abuse in health insurance and health care delivery, to promote the use of medical savings accounts, to improve access to long-term care services and coverage, and to simplify the administration of health insurance. HIPAA was subsequently updated by the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act of 2005, as well as the 2009 Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act and the final Omnibus Rule of 2013. As the law stands today, there are two major provisions that impact EMS agencies profoundly and directly. The first is the HIPAA Privacy Rule, and the second is the HIPAA Security Rule. The Privacy Rule addresses the use and disclosure of individuals' health information by covered entities, such as ambulance services. The rule establishes standards for individuals' privacy rights, and it attempts to permit the use of private health information as needed for the efficient functioning of the healthcare system, while also protecting the privacy of the patients within that system. The security rule was established by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to standardize security requirements and protocols for certain health information that is held or transferred in electronic form. The security rule integrates into many of the protections contained within the privacy rule to further protect private health data. While HIPAA is often cited in the field of EMS as the de facto law for patient privacy and confidentiality, not all healthcare providers are automatically governed by the law. HIPAA itself applies to health plans, 
healthcare clearinghouses, and any healthcare provider who transmits health information in electronic form. While it seems unlikely in today's electronic age that there would be any ambulance service out there that does not transmit healthcare data electronically, if one did exist, HIPAA would not apply given its own definition of the entities covered by the law. One thing to note, however, is that even if an entity is not considered to be a covered entity under HIPAA, if that non-covered entity interfaces with a covered entity and the covered entity's healthcare data, that non-covered entity would be considered to be a business associate of the covered entity, which means that the entity must abide by the HIPAA privacy rule requirements as well. The privacy rule itself deals with what is known as protected health information, which encompasses any information, including demographic data, that either identifies the individual directly or could be reasonably used with other information to identify the individual. A patient name, date of birth, social security number, home address, or driver's license number could all be used to identify a patient and would be considered protected health information under HIPAA. Even information that relates to an individual's past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition, the provision of health care to the individual, or past, present, or future payments for the provision of health care to the individual, may also qualify as protected health information if it can be used to identify the individual. It is also not unusual to have what is known as de-identified health information within a patient's record as well. This type of information neither identifies nor provides a reasonable basis to identify an individual. It is possible to de-identify what would otherwise be considered protected health information by stripping unique data identifiers like name, date of birth, and so on from a patient's record. De-identified health information is not considered to be protected health information under HIPAA and there are no restrictions on the use or disclosure of that information under HIPAA. With that being said, it is not always possible, nor would it make sense, to de-identify protected health information given various circumstances. While HIPAA prevents healthcare providers from releasing confidential patient information, remember that HIPAA attempts to balance patient privacy with legitimate healthcare system needs to share patient information. As a result, HIPAA has a laundry list of circumstances in which the disclosure of protected health information is permitted. Obviously, it makes sense to allow the healthcare provider to share protected healthcare information with the patient him or herself. Any information necessary for the treatment of the patient, payment for services, or for necessary healthcare operations may be shared without the patient's specific consent. This is what allows the ambulance providers to share patient data with the receiving hospital. How strange would it be if an ambulance crew could not share a patient's name with hospital staff when dropping the patient off at the emergency department? The healthcare providers may also share protected health information as permitted through the individual's own consent to do so. HIPAA also recognizes something called incidental use and disclosure, whereby there are some situations in which patient privacy simply cannot be assured despite the use of reasonable safeguards. Have you ever had to transport more than one patient simultaneously in the back of an ambulance from a mass casualty incident? If so, there is no way to communicate with the separate patients and the receiving hospital without the patients hearing information about the other patient. As the original disclosure of information, such as the phone call to the receiving hospital, was permitted, the fact the other patient overheard the information was incidental and therefore not a HIPAA violation. Certain public interest and benefit activities are also recognized exceptions to the HIPAA privacy rule whereby a use or disclosure of protected health information is permitted without the patient's consent. These include scenarios where the use or disclosure is required by law, certain public health activities, mandatory reporting requirements typically involving abuse, neglect, or domestic violence, health oversight activities, judicial and administrative proceedings, law enforcement purposes, when the dead patient must be identified, a cause of death must be determined, or to facilitate an organ or tissue donation.
for research purposes, when there is a serious threat to health or safety, and some essential governmental functions for the purposes of complying with workers' compensation laws, or in cases where research, healthcare operations, or public health purposes require access to a limited data set of protected health information for related purposes. There is also something in HIPAA called an authorized use in disclosure, which is different from a permitted use in disclosure. An authorized use in disclosure requires the written permission of the individual whose protected health information is being used or disclosed. Some examples would include the results of a pre-employment physical examination or lab test, disclosure of psychotherapy notes, and certain marketing communications. The privacy rule also contains something known as the minimum necessary provision. Essentially, when a disclosure is made, the covered entity has the responsibility to share only the minimum amount of protected health information necessary to accomplish the purpose of the disclosure. For clarification, this minimum necessary requirement does not apply to information shared for the purposes of treatment, information provided to the individual, and in a few other limited circumstances. Additionally, access to the protected health information must be restricted only to those individuals within the organization who need access to the protected health information as a part of performing their jobs. Thus, when making a disclosure, a covered entity must not only attempt to minimize the protected health information shared to that necessary for the purpose of the disclosure, but it must also attempt to ensure only those individuals necessary for processing the protected health information receive that information. The requirements for covered entities do not end there, however. Covered entities must also develop and implement written privacy policies and procedures. Each covered entity must establish a contact person or office for receiving complaints and providing information. There must be a privacy official or officer within the organization who is ultimately responsible for the development, implementation, and assurance of compliance with organization's privacy policies, procedures, and practices. All workforce members must be trained on the covered entity's privacy policies and, if there is a violation of the privacy rule, appropriate sanctions must be taken against those employees. The covered entity must use reasonable and appropriate administrative, technical, and physical safeguards to prevent disclosures in violation of the privacy rule. The entity must provide notice of its privacy practices, it must provide copies of a patient's records to the patient upon request, and the covered entity cannot retaliate against a person for exercising his or her rights under the privacy rule, assisting in an investigation, or for opposing an act that is in violation of the privacy rule. If a covered entity has a disclosure of protected health information that occurred in violation of the privacy rule, the covered entity must track that disclosure for at least six years. This even includes breaches that occur as a result of an intentional external act, such as someone hacking a service provider's computer system. If an individual has a legally authorized individual acting on his or her behalf, the privacy rule treats that personal representative the same as the individual him or herself. HIPAA automatically considers parents of minor children to be personal representatives of the minor child. If there is some reason why that assumption is incorrect, HIPAA defers to the appropriate state law to determine just what rights the parents would have to the protected health information for their minor children. If HIPAA is violated by a covered entity, the repercussions can be significant. HIPAA is enforced by the Office of Civil Rights and, while the Office of Civil Rights will routinely work with covered entities to ensure voluntary compliance with HIPAA, the Office of Civil Rights also has the ability to impose civil penalties of $100 to $50,000 or more for a HIPAA violation. If the violation is willful, the penalty may go up to $250,000 with up to 10 years of prison for the responsible party. In addition to HIPAA, many states have their own patient privacy and confidentiality laws that commonly provide additional protections over and above those provided by HIPAA. There may be other state laws, besides those that specifically relate to patient privacy and confidentiality, that may also come into play. In such cases, HIPAA was not designed to preempt other state laws, such as open records laws. If such an open records law applies to a governmental EMS agency, release of information is permitted under HIPAA as required by that law. 
As open records laws typically cover governmental entities only, a similar release by a private EMS agency may be a HIPAA violation because the private service is probably not covered by the same open records law. Again, the intersection of these various laws can differ significantly from state to state. As just mentioned, many states have their own laws that govern patient privacy and confidentiality. Such provisions may be more restrictive or encompassing than HIPAA. For example, a state's patient confidentiality laws may govern all healthcare providers within the state, not just those that deal with electronic records as required by HIPAA. The state may also provide for a private cause of action, meaning the healthcare agency or provider can be sued directly by the patient. Given that these requirements can vary considerably between jurisdictions, it is important for EMS providers to be familiar with the patient privacy and confidentiality laws that apply within their respective state of practice. As far as patient confidentiality is concerned, some states also recognize something known as privileged communications between certain parties, such as those between an attorney and his or her client or a physician and his or her patient. Such communications are routinely protected by state laws to ensure open, honest communications in relationships where such communications, without fear of the information being shared, is critical. Some states may consider EMS providers to be an extension of a physician, meaning that communications made to an EMS provider by a patient is privileged and cannot be disclosed to a third party. Other states do not extend that patient-physician privilege to EMS providers. It is important for EMS providers to know how such a privilege is treated in their respective state. Shifting gears from patient privacy and confidentiality, we will now explore advanced directives. Remember from our earlier discussions that patients have tremendous personal autonomy rights and, so long as the patient has the capacity to make decisions for him or herself, medical providers cannot force the patient to receive any treatment that he or she does not want. Unfortunately, there are often times when an individual may lack capacity due to a medical or other condition, such as medical infirmity, advanced aged, or an altered mental status. In such cases, it is difficult for a healthcare provider to know just what the patient would want done when a medical need or crisis arises. Advanced directives were created so that people can ensure their healthcare wishes are honored if they become incapacitated. Such advanced directives are defined by the individual states and can vary in name and scope. One of the first most common types of advanced directive is a living will, which tells healthcare providers what the person would want done if he or she is ever unable to share those desires due to incapacity. A living will has no bearing or effect on the person's healthcare decisions while of sound mental status. The provisions of a living will only become effective and enforceable once the person is is incapacitated to a certain degree. Power of attorney is another advanced directive that is commonly available. Within the context of healthcare, the specific advanced directive is called a power of attorney for healthcare or a healthcare power of attorney. This type of advanced directive gives someone the ability to make healthcare decisions for the person who executed the document. The person named within the healthcare power of attorney document essentially stands in the place of the patient with the ability to make healthcare decisions for the patient. It is common for healthcare power of attorney documents to sit idle while the patient is in good health with full decision making capacity. Once some type of event occurs that impacts that decision making capacity, however, the healthcare power of attorney document then springs into action. States commonly recognize other types of power of attorney documents that may or may not include the ability to make healthcare decisions. If ever confronted with such a document, the healthcare provider should make sure it deals specifically with the ability to make healthcare decisions for the patient. Another common advanced directive is a do not resuscitate order that applies if the patient ever enters into a pulseless non-breathing state. Depending on the circumstances, there may be patients who anticipate such an occurrence in the near future and prefer to not have any extraordinary or heroic measures performed once the end is near, so to speak. A do not resuscitate order is designed to ensure the patient can still control his or her personal autonomy at the end of life. Once in place, common resuscitative measures such as CPR should not be performed. While such orders do not necessarily apply if affirmative actions are taken to end a life, such as an attempted suicide, the goal is to allow the natural process of dying to occur without intervention. 
Do not resuscitate orders. Help protect the integrity of the patient who knows his or her time is limited and wants to die of natural causes with dignity. Obviously, EMS providers never know who their patients will be during a shift and, given the emergency nature of EMS, there is no time to review medical records and legal documents beforehand like one could do if caring for someone in an ICU or nursing home. If advanced directives are in place for a particular patient, the EMS crew may not even find out about them. As with many of the topics we have discussed, the laws related to advanced directives vary from state to state and EMS providers need to be familiar with the advanced directive laws that apply to them within their state of practice. So what happens if a person from one state has an advanced directive from that state and just so happens to be in another state when an event occurs that gives rise to the application of that advanced directive? In theory, states are supposed to give full faith and credit to the laws of other states, which would include legal advance directives from other states. In practice, however, that can be challenging for the EMS provider. If there is ever an issue or question with regard to an advance directive in the field, the EMS provider should follow his or her local protocols and contact medical control for guidance. One other thing to keep in mind is that advance directives apply to specific medical circumstances. If a patient with an advanced directive seeks treatment or assistance for an unrelated condition, the expectation is that the patient will receive the same level of care as if he or she did not have the advanced directive in place. If a person with a do not resuscitate order, for example, calls 911 for difficulty breathing, the crew should still treat the patient's difficulty breathing. Invariably, advanced directives are one topic where EMS providers like to generate what-if scenarios all the time. It is in the best interest of an EMS agency to ensure it has a strong protocol in place for handling patients with advanced directives as the circumstances of each unique case can have a significant impact on what arguably should be done. As far as healthcare laws are concerned, Medicare and Medicaid are huge given their financial impact to functioning EMS agencies. Medicare is a federal insurance program for people 65 years of age and older, certain younger people with disabilities, and people with end-stage renal disease. The program itself has different parts or options that include hospital insurance, medical insurance, Medicare Advantage plans offered by third parties that contract with Medicare, and prescription drug coverage. Medicaid is a health and medical services program for individuals and families with low incomes. Benefits and eligibility are predominantly defined by the individual states with age, pregnancy status, disability status, and other factors as routine considerations for eligibility. The importance of Medicare and Medicaid to ambulance services is that billing for services provided to a person covered by Medicare or Medicaid is governed by the applicable program's rules. As a matter of fact, Medicare has an ambulance fee schedule that delineates how Medicare will pay ambulance services for the treatment and transport of patients. This fee schedule applies to all EMS agencies, whether municipal, private, volunteer, full-time, hospital-based, or otherwise. This schedule includes a base rate payment given the service level provided plus mileage. Ambulance services that bill Medicare must accept the funds from Medicare as payment in full, even if the amount paid is nowhere near what the agency charges for such transports. While Medicaid is a little different from Medicare given that it is jointly funded by the federal government and the states, the states still establish their own Medicaid provider payment rates, which must fall within the federal requirements. Another interesting facet of Medicare reimbursement is that Medicare pays for ambulance transports only when considered medically necessary or when the service is unscheduled, such as in the case of a 911 call. There is no Medicare reimbursement for non-transports. To figure out how Medicare payments are made to ambulance service providers, it is first necessary to understand the types of service levels denoted within the ambulance fee schedule. These levels include basic life support, advanced life support level one, advanced life support level two, paramedic advanced life support intercept, specialty care transport, fixed wing transport, and rotary wing transport. Most of these are probably self-explanatory except for the difference between advanced life support levels one and two. ALS-1 includes an ALS assessment by an ALS provider or the provision of at least one ALS intervention. 
ALS-2 includes multiple advanced interventions, such as three or more med pushes, manual defibrillation, endotracheal intubation, and others. The textbook provides a full definition if you would like to research this further. When calculating Medicare reimbursements, you must first start with the base rate for a non-emergency BLS ambulance transport. The rate used in the 2017 fee schedule is $222.29. Depending on the level of care provided, that base rate is then multiplied by a relative value unit. If the call was a BLS non-emergency, the RVU is a 1. The RVU increases to 1.6 if it is a BLS emergent transport. ALS-1 is 1.2, ALS-1 emergency is 1.9, ALS-2 is 2.75, specialty care transport is 3.25, and paramedic ALS intercept is 1.75. Depending on where in the country the EMS care is provided, Medicare will use a geographic practice cost index to adjust the rate based upon regional differences. Lastly, a rural adjustment factor is included along with the RVU and the GPCI to the base rate. Rather than trying to calculate these various rates manually, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services makes annual tables available that provide already calculated rates. There are also numerous resources available on the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services website. One such resource is the list of Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System procedures and modifier codes, which can be used to determine reimbursement amounts for supplies, equipment, and procedures based upon the physician fee schedule. If your head is swimming, do not worry too much. Medicare and Medicaid are very large and complicated systems, and it is not unusual for EMS agencies to utilize billing services to assist with ensuring all Medicare and Medicaid billing is completed appropriately and within applicable rules. For the purposes of this legal overview, the information provided within the textbook and this presentation is probably more than adequate for most of those in EMS who are not directly responsible for service billing. One facet of Medicare and Medicaid billing that is probably more important to the average EMS provider is that of Medicare fraud and abuse. Such fraud and abuse are significant concerns for these programs as 2012 data showed that $78.6 million was paid for ambulance transports that did not meet Medicare requirements, were not covered, or were simply inappropriate, and 21% of all ambulance service providers within the United States were considered to have questionable billing practices. It should therefore be no surprise that there are a number of laws in place to combat Medicare fraud and abuse. The first such law is the Federal Anti-Kickback Statute, which makes it a crime to knowingly and willfully make or cause to be made any false statement or representation of a material fact in any application for any benefit or payment under a federal health care program. The law goes on to state that any knowing and willful solicitation or receipt of any remuneration, including any kickback, bribe, or rebate, directly or indirectly, overtly or covertly, in cash or in kind, in return for referring an individual to a person or service receiving federal health care program money, or for purchasing, leasing, or ordering any good, facility, service, or item for which payment may be made in whole or in part under a federal health care program is considered a federal felony. So what does that all mean for an EMS agency? Some practices that land EMS agencies into hot water include falsifying mileage, upcharging for services not actually provided, and falsely reporting patient disposition to bill for transports that were not medically necessary. Related specifically to kickbacks, working out agreements with other healthcare agencies to generate patient volume and subsequent Medicare billing, for example, could be a problem. For what it's worth, the anti-kickback statute does recognize some safe harbor activities that are not considered to be illegal under the law. These include space and equipment rental agreements, group purchasing organizations and discounts, warranties, practitioner recruitment in underserved areas, and others. Additional safe harbors can be approved by the Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General if need be. Penalties for violating the anti-kickback statute can include a fine of up to $25,000 and or imprisonment of up to five years. The real kicker, however, is that the guilty party may be precluded from participation in future federal health care programs. 
Sadly, there are numerous examples of EMS agencies that have been found guilty of violating the anti-kickback statute, and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has a vested interest in pursuing such cases given the amount of money involved. Somewhat related to the anti-kickback statute is the False Claims Act, which makes it illegal to present a false or fraudulent claim to the federal government for payment or approval. The hard-hitting facet of this law is that it allows private citizens to file a lawsuit against the alleged wrongdoer on behalf of the federal government in what is known as a quitom action. If such a lawsuit is successful, the person who filed the quitom action receives a percentage of any recovered damages, which obviously provides some incentive for the individual to pursue such a cause of action on behalf of the government. Also tied to Medicare billing and reimbursement is the substantiality in excess rule that prevents the payment of Medicare funds to entities who charge substantially in excess of their usual charges to Medicare or if the items or services provided were in excess of the patient's needs or of a quality that failed to meet professional standards of health care. What this means in most cases is that an ambulance service cannot charge Medicare more for services than it would bill the patient, an insurance company, or some other entity directly. There are some exceptions to this rule, such as costs or charges that are due to unusual circumstances or medical complications requiring additional time, effort, or expense. Relying on such an exception, however, can be risky as penalties for violating the substantiality and excess rule can include not only civil penalties, but an exclusion from receiving Medicare funding for one to three years. The False Claims Act also provides protection against retaliation for employees, contractors, or agents who report wrongdoing. If such retaliation occurs, the individual would be eligible for reinstatement with the same seniority status that he or she would have held prior to the retaliation along with compensatory damages. The statute of limitations for someone to file a claim for retaliation is three years after the date of the retaliatory action. The next healthcare related law we will explore is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act of 1986. This law requires hospital emergency departments to provide appropriate medical screening to determine whether or not someone presenting to the emergency department has an emergency medical condition. If so, the hospital must stabilize the patient before transferring or discharging the patient. The hospital must do this regardless of the patient's ability to pay for services. If the patient is in active labor, she must be admitted and treated until the delivery is completed unless a transfer to another facility is necessary for adequate treatment. Again, this medical care must be provided to the patient regardless of her ability to pay. So how does this law impact EMS? The answer lies in diversions and patient parking. There was a U.S. Court of Appeals decision in 2008 that found a hospital in violation of EMTALA by diverting a non-hospital-owned ambulance to another hospital without being on formal diversionary status. EMTALA recognizes an obligation on the part of a hospital with an emergency department to see, treat, and stabilize the patient delivered by ambulance once the ambulance enters the hospital's property or is within 250 yards of the hospital's main building. The only exception is an ambulance transporting a patient to a helipad that just so happens to be on the hospital's property. In that case, the patient is not being delivered to the hospital's emergency department, so an EMTALA obligation does not exist. Patient parking is another emergency department practice that seems to be growing in frequency even though such a practice may violate EMTALA. Patient parking or ambulance hijacking occurs when an ambulance crew delivers a patient to an emergency department and the hospital does not assume patient care from the ambulance crew for an unreasonable period of time. According to EMTALA, hospitals cannot delay the receipt of a patient from an EMS crew to avoid its obligation to assess the patient under EMTALA. The hospital's obligation to the patient begins once the ambulance arrives on the hospital property. Delaying the patient handoff process from the ambulance crew does not change that obligation. The Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, also known as the Controlled Substances Act, was designed to regulate the manufacture, importation, possession, use, and distribution of chemical substances, essentially medications and drugs. Any ambulance provider that carries controlled substances must be certain it complies with the applicable provisions of this law. 
The first important aspect of the law to understand is the classification of drugs and medications into specific categories delineated by the propensity for dependence and abuse of the substance in conjunction with the presence or absence of a recognized medical use for the drug. This system categorizes drugs into one of five drug schedules, with Schedule 1 drugs being the worst and Schedule 5 drugs being on the other end of that relative spectrum. How a drug is classified on the drug schedule can have an impact on acquisition, storage, and use requirements as defined within the law, so it is important for EMS providers and agencies to be familiar with this Controlled Substances Act classification system. One significant administrative requirement of the Controlled Substances Act is that any person or entity who manufactures, distributes, or dispenses controlled substances must be registered with the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency. In the case of an EMS agency, common practice is for the service to maintain a DEA registration number through its medical director and all EMS personnel function in the field under that number. According to the letter of the law, the Controlled Substances Act requires that a separate registration be obtained for each principal place of business or professional practice where controlled substances are manufactured, distributed, or dispensed. Unfortunately, the Controlled Substances Act was not written with the EMS in mind, so this requirement may be a surprise to some. Does that mean each individual ambulance needs its own DEA registration number? That answer may depend on who you ask, as there is some confusion over this provision as it applies to ambulance service providers. The general consensus at the time this presentation was prepared is that a separate DEA registration number for each standalone station house is probably adequate. As this provision is open to some interpretation, however, clear guidance is not available. If you are on an ambulance service that practices across state lines, a separate DEA registration number is required for each state in which the ambulance company practices. Security is also a major concern with regard to controlled substances, and the Controlled Substances Act requires effective controls and procedures to be in place to guard against theft or diversion of controlled substances. With that being said, there is no hard and fast rule as to what those controls and procedures must be beyond the requirement that controlled substances be stored in a securely locked and substantially constructed cabinet. The recommendation within the law is that the substantially constructed cabinet be a safe or steel cabinet equivalent to a U.S. government Class 5 security container. Thus, keeping the morphine in a jump kit is probably not adequate security under the Controlled Substances Act. Ultimately, if there is an issue as to security with an EMS agency, the DEA will look at numerous factors, such as the adequacy of key control systems, the type of controlled substances involved, the quantity of controlled substances handled, and so on. The textbook provides a comprehensive list of these and other factors that are used to gauge the effectiveness of the controls and procedures that are in place to prevent controlled substance theft or diversion. As a matter of clarification, there was an unfortunate typo in the textbook on page 197. The word not was somehow excluded from the text when referring to the use of a double lock system, which changes the meaning of the sentence entirely. To clarify, it is not necessary to utilize a double lock system to secure controlled substances. The use of a single securely locked and substantially constructed cabinet is all that is required in that aspect, although a double lock system would arguably increase security and therefore would probably be favored by the DEA when conducting a controls and procedures audit. Despite these various precautions, if a significant loss, theft, or diversion of controlled substances occurs, the registrant must notify the Field Division Office of the DEA. The Controlled Substances Act also makes it illegal for a registrant to employ any person who has been convicted of a felony offense related to controlled substances if that person would be in a position to have access to controlled substances. Additionally, if a person has been denied a DEA registration, has had a DEA registration revoked, or has surrendered a DEA registration for cause, such a person should not be hired if he or she would be in a position to have access to controlled substances. Record keeping is also important under the Controlled Substances Act. Inventories and records of Schedule 1 and 2 controlled substances must be maintained separately from all other records. Schedule 3, 
four, and five inventories and records must be maintained separately from other ordinary business records unless they are readily retrievable from those records. Regardless of how the records are maintained, the registrant must retain such documents for a period of at least two years. Each registrant who maintains an inventory of controlled substances must also maintain a complete and accurate record of the controlled substances on hand with the date on which the inventory was conducted. These records must be written, typewritten, or in some other printed form and maintained at the registered location for at least two years from the date when the inventory was conducted. If a controlled substance is expired or otherwise needs to be removed from inventory, the EMT or staff cannot simply throw it away as the Controlled Substances Act requires the registrant to contact the special agent in charge of the DEA in its geographical area to request authority and instructions to dispose of such substances. If authorization is provided, the registrant needs to follow the specific instructions provided by the special agent in charge. If the need to dispose of controlled substances occurs on a somewhat regular basis, the special agent in charge may authorize disposal without prior approval of the DEA in each instance. The registrant would need to maintain adequate records of such disposals and file periodic reports with the DEA. Prior to disposal, any such controlled substance must be rendered unusable and unretrievable. It is also possible for a registrant to dispose of out-of-date, damaged, or otherwise unwanted controlled substances by transferring them to a registrant authorized to receive controlled substances for disposal. If such a transfer is conducted, records must be maintained with either an appropriate DEA form, in the case of Schedule 1 and 2 controlled substances, or via an invoice, in the case of Schedule 3, 4, and 5 controlled substances. As part of daily routine practice, it is not unusual for an EMS provider to use only a portion of a controlled substance within a particular vial, ampule, or container. So what happens with the extra? Disposal of the controlled substance must occur in compliance with the aforementioned disposal requirements if any part of the controlled substance is recoverable. If there is breakage, damage, spillage, or some other form of destruction of a controlled substance, such non-recoverable quantities should be documented in inventory records and signed by two people who witnessed the destruction of the controlled substance. Beyond these disposal and wasting requirements, individual states may further define additional procedural requirements that apply. Penalties for violating the Controlled Substances Act vary considerably depending on the type of violation and the schedule category of the substance involved. If you are interested, the Congressional Research Service published a resource on maximum fines and terms of imprisonment for such violations in their 2012 document, Drug Offenses, Maximum Fines, and Terms of Imprisonment for Violation of the Federal Controlled Substances Act and Related Laws. Feel free to perform a quick internet search for the document if you are interested in researching the topic further. Keep in mind as well that individual states typically have their own laws dealing with the use of prohibited substances, which may also play a role in defining penalties for improperly distributing or using a controlled substance if prosecuted under applicable state law. To quickly help put some of these penalties into perspective, the unlawful distribution of a Schedule II substance can result in a $1 million fine and a prison term of up to 20 years, where the unlawful distribution of a Schedule V substance could result in a lesser fine of $100,000 and up to one year imprisonment. Even a simple possession conviction is serious with a fine of not less than $1,000 and the potential of up to one year in prison. Moving on from controlled substances, let's look at a law that many EMS providers may not even know exists. In 1988, Congress drafted the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments to ensure accuracy, reliability, and timeliness of patient test results regardless of location. If a facility performs testing on materials derived from the human body for the purpose of providing information on the diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of any disease or impairment of, or assessment of the health of, human beings, it is considered a laboratory under CLIA. With that definition in mind, how do EMS providers check blood glucose levels? Using a glucometer, EMS providers perform tests on blood derived from the human body for the purpose of providing information for the diagnosis or treatment of a disease or impairment. 
Now, you might be thinking that people can test themselves at home with glucometers, and you would be right. Under the CLIA provisions, there is such a thing as a wave test that is a simple laboratory examination and procedure that has an insignificant risk of an erroneous result. A laboratory may qualify for a certificate of waiver if it restricts its test to those that fall under this waived test definition. Laboratories performing only waived tests are not subject to routine survey or inspection. As far as EMS agencies are concerned, they should probably complete a CLIA waiver for performing blood glucose checks. While each ambulance could potentially be considered a separate laboratory, the law allows laboratories that are not at a fixed location to acquire a single certificate under a designated primary site or home base address. Therefore, a single CLIA waiver should be adequate for an EMS agency with multiple units. With a growing emphasis being placed on research within EMS, one other federal law we need to explore is the National Research Act of 1947. Given widespread atrocities related to human rights and research up to that time, the National Research Act was drafted to protect the rights, health, and well-being of human research subjects. This law gave rise to 45 CFR Section 46, which established the need for all human research projects to be vetted through an institutional review board to ensure respect for persons, beneficence, and justice when conducting any research involving human subjects. Depending on the nature of the research being performed, various federal agencies, such as the Food and Drug Administration or the Office of Human Research Protections under Health and Human Services, may be involved in maintaining regulatory oversight of the IRB process. The inclusion of IRB requirements within the textbook is simply for awareness only. IRB regulations themselves can be very complex and specific in their application. For EMS agencies participating in research studies involving human patients, it is critical that the agency ensures integrity in the research process through the use of an IRB. Given that academic institutions, universities and medical schools in particular, are often involved in research activities, EMS agencies may want to partner with academic institutions when performing research activities. That brings us to the end of the chapter. We covered a lot of material, beginning with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, which addresses the use and disclosure of protected health information by covered entities, along with rules related to individual patient privacy rights to control how their health information is used. We discussed the need for covered entities to ensure appropriate administrative, technical, and physical safeguards are in place to prevent intentional or unintentional use or disclosure of protected health information in violation of HIPAA's privacy rule, and also recognize that many states have their own laws that address patient privacy and confidentiality. We also looked at different advanced directives that exist in most states, such as living wills, health care power of attorneys, and do not resuscitate orders. Our next major topic was Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is the federal health insurance program for people who are 65 years of age or older, certain younger people with disabilities, and people with end-stage renal disease. Medicaid, by comparison, is a health and medical services program for individuals and families with low incomes. Given the size of the federal Medicare program, fraud and abuse are significant concerns. To address fraud and abuse in Medicare, laws such as the Federal Anti-Kickback Statute, the False Claims Act, and the Substantiality and Excess Rule define certain impermissible activities related to Medicare billing and arrangements between healthcare entities to increase patient referrals for the purpose of also increasing Medicare billings. We looked at the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act of 1986 and how the language within the law applies to hospitals with emergency departments by recognizing the duty to assess, treat, and stabilize patients before discharging or transferring those patients. A patient's ability to pay for services cannot be used to deny such services by an emergency department that receives federal funds and the practices of diverting ambulances once they are on hospital property or hijacking an ambulance while waiting to assume patient care are problematic and contrary to the requirements defined within EMTALA. The Controlled Substances Act regulates the manufacture, importation, possession, use, and distribution of drugs and medications, and many of its provisions apply directly to ambulance services and their providers. 
We discussed the clinical laboratory improvement amendments and how an ambulance could qualify as a laboratory under CLIA, which therefore makes it important for an ambulance service to obtain a CLIA waiver to perform blood glucose testing in the field. Lastly, we also looked ever so briefly at the National Research Act and how it gave rise to institutional review board requirements to ensure the rights, health, and well-being of human research subjects are protected when such research is performed. In our next module, we will explore the impact of technology on fire and emergency services, along with legal principles related to intellectual property and various laws designed to provide transparency in governmental operations.